Date is February 9th, 1995. We're interviewing Dr. Herbert Zipper. The interviewer is Sandy Jacobson in Los Angeles, USA. We're going to speak English. Okay. Just one second to speak. Oh, no, I have to speak. Dr. Zipper, thank you so much for participating. We're very honored to have you. You're very welcome. But you have to excuse my voice. It is not in its natural stage today. I will try to, my best to control it, but I can't guarantee it. All right. Would you tell me your uh, full name and when you were born, please? My full name is Herbert Zipper. That's all, all, that's all of it. I was born on April 27, 1904 in the heart of Vienna. You want to have the address? Mm -hmm. uh, number 31 Amgraben. That is that large place in the center of the city adjoining to the place in which the cathedral is, which is the, the tower that characterizes Vienna. Tell me about your family. Well, my father was an inventor, an engineer, who represented the spirit of the time of the fin de siècle and the, the beginning of this century, which, in a few words, meant that every problem of humanity can be solved by science and technology. That at that time, in the early 1900s, that uh, the good life could be forever if you just let science and technology work its way. that wars are obsolete, that uh, security of, of all could be practically guaranteed. That means that we young people, we kids, grew up in an atmosphere of utter security of a security in which everything could be solved if we just learn enough, do enough uh, uh, scientific research, and do not uh, be steeped in metaphysical thinking. That means the arts became a, a way of life, in many ways replaced religion. Uh, religion, it's at the Austrian capital, although it was a Catholic country, and there were, of course, about 180,000 Jews, uh, but the religion itself played a very minor role. The middle class uh, was, in many ways, uh, living more with the arts than with, with, uh, with religion. <coughs> Excuse me. This was the, uh, let's say, the, the climate in which we grew up. I'm not trying to, to make it sound uh, idealistic. Of course, it was a pipe dream, as you know. And if you read Kafka, you will find out that there were, of course, the thinkers, those who, the artists, who have the gift, and I should like to emphasize that, they do not really live and work beyond their time. The artist sees its own time much clearer than the average people. People in general know their past and very little their presence. 
It's the artists who really project the presence. That's why they're always called they're ahead of their time. They aren't ahead of their time, they are with their time. And of course, if you read the great, the great writers, if you look, for instance, at the, at the people who started painting, if you look at Klimt's painting, if you look at Kokoschka's painting, they were all part of this culture, which was so colorful in retrospect, of course. And I must say, when I was, when World War I started, I began to, th to see this myself. My nose grew faster and bigger. This was the, the, the climate in which we grew up, and I must say, we have been extremely fortunate to grow, grow up in that climate, because learning and Thing was part of not of you have to do it, but we wanted to do it because this was the promise of the good life. Tell me about your mother. Let me, let me pause this for one second. Right. So um, I was asking you about your mother. My mother. Well, I'm I'm getting a bit soft when I think of my mother. My mother was the most lovable person, and I know that all my friends, all the friends of my, my brother and sister, all the, the people who knew her, fell in love with her. She was Rosie for everybody. Her name was Regina, but he called her Rosie. My father used to call her Rosie, and her parents called her that way. Uh, she was she was really, in, in every way, uh, exuding life, exuding the, the spirit of life. She, uh, she was never really, she never was ill. She was always full of spirit. And uh, I know that pa parties of the parents who gave it home, which uh, were always uh, visited by our fr own friends, young friends, she was always the, this, the center of attraction. She was not an intellectual, you know. Of course she read a great deal. She was, the, she was a very good pianist, and I mean, she was really the, the daughter of a Viennese middle class. But she helped in conversation. She helped making a conversation go as a, a certain type of Viennese woman could do. You know, Alma Maria Mahler was one of those. I'm not, not comparing her with her. But Alma Maria Mahler was also not an intellectual, but I have been in one of her uh, Thursday afternoon teas, where there were always some very important people of, of the, after the death of Gustav. And I find she had that gift of making people draw people out of their, of their shells, and, and she started strong controversies that were always a, a help for intellectual thinking. My mother could do this too. Tell me a little bit about the parties that your parents would have, the kind of social life that they had and the people that would come to that. I don't recall much of the parties before the war. Uh, I was too young at that time, and uh, we were always sitting, having our uh, meals with the parents. Now you're talking about World War One. Of course. <laughs> of course, we're talking about... <laughs> I have to laugh. <laughs> I'm that ancient, that's it. Uh, uh, I couldn't recall, I recall that we had, I recall that both my brother and I, we always listen when in the conversation of, of the adults. This was, this is what's missing in today's, <coughs> in today's civilization. The children have their own culture, their own life while we took part in the life of the adult. And that's where I learned the most. 
if I let you say one thing, I don't recall uh, the persons, especially except, of course, the relatives, especially mother's parents, for instance, especially her father, who was a very strong intellectual person. Um, they had conversations. You know? They had, for instance, strong uh, controversies with my father. My, uh, at that time, my grandfather was a more uh, radical, is not the right word, he wasn't a real radical, but from my father's point of view, he was more radical than my father. And therefore there were conversations in which, of course, we both, my brother and I, took delight. And then World War I started. These two shots in Sarajevo, I have to say something about Sarajevo, because it is so much in the limelight today, and that somehow characterizes my father, characterizes the whole culture. It was in October 1908, and I recall my father coming home Livid. Overnight, the Austrian government annexed Bosnia and Herzegovina. And my father, really furiously, said that means only more problem for us. There will be always problem down there. They never can live together because they want the, the Catholics and the, the Orthodox and the Islamic people, they never can live together. That somehow, the, he used to say, the devil has put them there. And he was ranting, and then of course it, he said that we, we will have trouble. And that's where the World War started. That's where the shots were fired against the crown president of Austria, Franz Ferdinand and his wife, the two shots that, of that, uh, that radical student, Mr. Prokop, it was just a, 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 not a high school, I think he was already in college, who shot both of them, and that started the war, which in retrospect, and even then, now we would like to talk about that, even then, was the most idiotic conflict that ever was. There was really no issue. There was, there was the issue of land grabbing, there was the issue of, of the, the weapons industry to make more money on all sides. I mean, if you I just gave a lecture last March, last year, March, and uh, I read the list of the war declarations of that, of that 19, year 1918. It was funny, it was laughable, that every, everybody in the world declared war against everybody else. From, from Central Europe to Western Europe to Eastern Europe to Japan. How did your life change after World War I? It changed already during World War I. See, there is one thing which I also observed during World War II when I had my students, Manila, and the young people. When something as cataclysmic happens as a war. Yeah, Okay, we were talking yeah. about... Yeah, uh, yeah. Like one grows know. up twice as fast in such times of real trouble. You see, the security that we felt so strongly was suddenly broken. We didn't know his fa his father to go to war or is he going to stay home. He was, at that time, he was direct, uh, technical director of the, possibly, I think it was the large, largest Central European 
industrial combine. He had to, he, under his leadership, there were 52 plants all over Austria. And one, one third of the year he was always out traveling. So he couldn't, they, they wouldn't let him go to war. But he didn't know, because one day he appeared in uniform. He appeared in uniform? Yeah. And so therefore our interest into, in, in what is happening, that was so strongly focused to our own life, to the life at home, was suddenly projected entirely to the world. That means we grew up much faster. A boy in, let's say, in the winter of 1914-15 could not be compared to a boy of the same age today because we were living with, with the history that was being made. And in addition to that, in the summer, bef when, as a, when before the war was really started, but when the, the diplomatic stupidities were being enacted, there was a young poet who accompanied us, our governess and we, our children, when we, were, when we walked every morning to Schoenbrunn. We didn't go to the country because my father was afraid of, of the war being coming up, that we should be at home. And he was a, he was a real radical, a poem who saw his time and who explained to me in no uncertain term, what the powers are, what really drives it. Why he was really right. Uh, my father prohibited uh, my governess that, that, that any contact with that man. When he heard me talking about these things, he said, who is that who is talking, you see? But uh, my governess seemingly was a lovely person seemingly was of the same opinion, and so I got a very good education about, about uh, our government, about the French government, about Russia. He was very well educated, that young man. I think he, will, he was imprisoned. Now are you talking about the poet? Yeah. Uh -huh. But I owe him a great deal of early waking up to realities and not to the fairy tales that society is spreading, especially to the children. How, so, were, you, how were you educated? Well, I was educated like all the ones. I went to, to the gymnasium, to the Latin school, I had eight years of Latin and five years of Greek and, and I got what, what was called the education of a, of a well, a well rounded middle class boy. But you went to, did you, you had tutoring at, at home until you were how old? No, in the first grade only. But I had that governess, she was, she taught us French. And uh, I was pretty fluent. Mm -hmm. We talked with her only in French. Now, what about when you started studying music? When was that? When that was long before the war. I started. My mother had a, a, a piano teacher. Uh, I got a piano teacher of my own first, an Italian by the name of uh, Radovani. And he lasted only a few months because I didn't like him. I said it was impossible. And I wanted to, the piano teacher of my mother. What was her name? Well, it's not that immaterial. They come after. It comes to me. This is Vukovic. <laughs> not so easy to remember. She was very good. And, and I was playing the piano pretty soon in a way so that I could play with my mother forehand piano with forehand Schubert and, and Haydn pieces so that could make music together. 
music was part of life. I mean, we, you, I cannot tell you what it was. Because today you have that eternal loudspeaker that is accompanying our life every day, all the, all the 24 hours. You cannot even listen to a stupid advertising without having something in the background going on, groaning. The other day I heard something that was, it was too funny for words, a, a bass tuba accompanying an automobile sales pitch with, <laughs> with groaning and completely senseless noises. But it was, it was called music. Mm -hmm. So when did you realize that music, more than being just a part of your life as you recognized it, would be how you would, uh, what, what your occupation would be? Yeah, you see, this was not such an extremely outrageous idea at that time. Being a musician, was part of society. And I can tell you if, if a, a kid went into the streetcar with a violin case, everybody looked approvingly at that kid. Not today. I don't know Indiana. I haven't seen any kids with violin cases going to the streetcar. But that was part of it. The, uh, you see, I grew up without any of the electronic medias. There was no radio, no television, no gramophone recording, nothing. If you wanted to have music, you had to make it yourself. You had to go to a concert or possibly to a church. That was all. You had some famous musicians that were part of your, uh, if they were part of your circle, or you, you would um, meet with them. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, the, then, when I later on, when I, of course, started seriously, I mean, I started seriously immediately, actually. And I, I called a conversation with my father when I was about 10 or 11, 11. It was during the war. Maybe it was 12. I don't, no, that is not, it's rather immaterial. Uh, I, he said to me, Herbert, it seemed to me that you want to be a taking music as a profession. He said, you are guessing right. He said, I just want to tell you, I don't, don't want to talk you out of it, I just want to tell you what the problems are. I mean, what the financial problems are, what the social problems are, what, what's in store, and how hard it is. That music, the study of music, is much more intricate than any other study. And I learned at that time clearly what he, he said that it was very, very observing. He said, if you are learning in high school your mathematics, your algebra, your, your, your geometry and so forth, you can go to the technical high school, to the technical college, and in four years you get a diploma and you are a good engineer. That you can do. You cannot go and do all these things that you need to learn as, a, as an educated person and then go to college and say, I want to learn the violin. You have to start as you started, he said, when you are a very small kid. You have to grow up with the music. You have to become... Music is... he, he knew it. Uh, music is a much more complicated and a much more demanding thing than any other of the things. Maybe, he said, maybe medicine may be that, that difficult. So you have to face a very hard study in addition to what you do with everybody else. Is. I mean, your Latin, your, your algebra, and so on. So he didn't scare me, but uh, he felt that it was important to tell me. And then I, when I decided yes, then I had his support. His and mother's support were there at all times. And I had no problem with my family being a, being a musician. That problem came later on because of the question of space. Because what, what, after the, what Vienna was after the war, after we lost the war, can, cannot be imagined. 
how a city becomes devoid of any amenities. There was absolutely no food. Now we're talking again about World War I. There was no food. There was nothing to heat. Most of the time we didn't get electricity because there was no no way, no coal that they could fire the plants. Plan <coughs> the plants. It was a real desperate time. The reason why I'm still getting up at mo in the morning at four thirty. But I had that's what I had to do. Before school I went around to every market in the neighborhood with my bicycle that had leather leather uh, pneumatics. Wheels, tires. Tires. Leather tires because you rubber was in was unavailable. Just to find out where I could get some of these ugly beads and these things that you that you just fill your stomach with. Uh, let's say my winter coat at that time, I grew, uh, at the time in 1918, I was f my full size. I was oh, six foot, one and a half. Now I shrunk like Irish linen. <laughs> but I was really very tall and grew out of all my things. So my winter coat was made out of paper. You have a, a very it is impossible to imagine for any American what a city becomes when it loses suddenly every, every raison d'etre, practically. This was the large capital of a, of a large empire, and suddenly this empire was gone. And that's why it was a small country of seven million people who all tried to eke out a life for themselves. It was an, an, a very bad time, also socially. People didn't trust each other. Each one, each, everybody start, start, try, started to to uh, to look out for himself only, to try to grab something to make it out just the sheer livelihood. The uh, question of starvation is one of the most demeaning uh, questions. Suddenly, everything else goes into the background, and you cannot get rid of the idea food. Did you notice at that time a rise in anti Semitism? At that time, I don't recall a time without anti Semitism in any form or another. This is an endemic disease, endemic disease. That has gone with us, has accompanied the life of the Europeans and many other countries too for the past 2,000 years. I mean, one has to, it was not, a, of course, it, was, it became worse because the, there was this, a part of, of so called intellectual uh, Europe that started to. Uh, Blame the Jews for the for the war. We have to find, as a comic, a German comic in Munich said about that anti-Semitism. Is it's, it's the Jews and the bicyclists <laughs> to be blamed. <laughs> and as he was asked, and on, that's was on stage. Was that why? Because there are too many of them anywhere. <laughs> Continuing our uh, interview with Dr. Herbert Zipper, talking to Sandy Jacobson in Los Angeles, California. We're speaking English. It's the 9th of February, 1995, and this is take two. Talk about your father. My father used to say, you have to be twice as good as everybody else, because you must never forget that you are Jewish. Jewish meant, of course, the tradition the tradition of the Jewish society, which is, of course, each order. They ask me, what is it? What is it, really? Well, it's very difficult to put your finger on one thing. But outstanding of the Jewish tradition is 
the utter respect for knowledge, the utter respect for the written word, the respect for books, the respect for the accomplishment of the mind. This is the guiding and let's say the, the innate thing of the Jewish tradition. Regardless whether there has anything to do with religion or not. In our case it was not religion at all. Religion was never, con never discussed at home. As I was allowed to stop religious lessons when I was 12. And that was actually the majority of the middle class in Vienna. The middle class in Vienna was agnostic. Mm -hmm. But you had re religious people in your family, both of your grandfathers had. Yeah, oh, yes. yes, that was just about 15 years earlier. My grandfather was a rabbi, my other grandfather was a <coughs> was a cantor, my father's father, whom he never knew, because he died when he was 60, six years old, so I did never know him. My grandmother used to uh, still keep Jewish holidays in certain way, but I think she more or less declared what was really uh, necessary to abide by the Jewish rules. She was making their rules in herself. So now you were growing up in Vienna yeah. in this very tumult tumultuous time. No food. Uh, you, you continued your education? You continued to go to school? Of Vienna? course. Of course I continued my education. I con uh, <coughs> graduated when I, was 20, when I was 17 in 1921. From the gymnasium? From the gymnasium, yeah. You went to the Goethe? And, uh, to go to gymnasium. And then went straight, I started already uh, the last year to, to went to the academy to, to uh, got my preliminary things going there. Which academy was that? The State Academy of Music and, and uh, Performing Arts. Who were some of your teachers then? That was, it was uh, Mandicheski, so today I just heard about him. He was, uh, he was, a, uh, he was a, a very close friend of Brahms and actually did start the collected, the addition of the collected works of Brahms. Uh, but that's, that li would lead me too far away to tell you about him. Um, you were in a workshop with, with uh, Ravel? No, with, 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 with Strauss, with Richard Strauss. Stra no, not the workshop. The, uh, uh, Strauss and later on for one, one semester Ravel were what, what we would call uh, lectures who come in, came in once a month and, and discuss. No, I was a student really of Joseph Marx. And how did you see your profession in music? Were you, were you planning to be a concert pianist? To no, I, see, I tell you, it's very, very frustrating. One of the, in the second year, I think, in, I think, at the examination, Strauss was there and asked me, well, what, what do you want to be? And I said, I want to be a pianist. He said, come on, a pianist. I a dime a dozen. So he said, you're pretty tall. He said, you should be a conductor. So we see if a man like Richard Strauss, who for us was a god, would say any, or any teacher of in whom we had trust would say anything, we would do this exactly. So that's why I started the same year. I think he managed it or he first sent it to some assistant. In one of the Viennese theaters, I became an assistant during my studies. You and became an assistant? To? to in, the, in the theater where I conducted Saturday afternoon performance for the kids. Mm -hmm. And there I started learning the trade. And he thought, I think Strauss didn't think very much of our school of conducting at that time. 
But that was an internal thing, and I was wondering why he didn't didn't show me. And I knew now, of course, why because it was really mediocrity. Was I'm sorry. A mediocrity oh. at that time. That the teacher who uh, at the conducting school. Um, yeah, that was all, uh, that was very simple. I mean, uh, as but from then on, the career of a successful student of the academy was was caved out. Mm -hmm. They knew exactly. I had all my first contact was been in, in the last year of my study at it, before my graduation. I had already a contract with whom? With, with a German theater. With the theater. Yeah, yeah. So besides so, the conducting, you also did a lot of music arranging, didn't you? Well, I did all kinds of music and things. First of all, I composed. My major was composition, and I could you tell the story about how you had um, a Hungarian friend? You were busy doing what you were pretty sure were somebody else's compositions. He would call you and he'd say, "Okay, we need something." Oh, else. Eugen Sander. He, I met him here. Uh, Eugen Sander. You see, <coughs> you know, of course used to our skills uh, to earn some money because things were very different after the war than they were before the war. And Eugen Sador always um, being a very clever Hungarian, very gifted man, did accept too much work which was always had to be delivered in time, in a certain time. And so he needed some, needed some subcontractors, <laughs> call it. And I was his subcontractor for quite some time. I don't recall anymore for how long, but I know for quite some time. I did, I did all kinds of scoring, especially for the uh, for the Viennese operettas. I never knew who was the com composer. I began to, to form their style, to think this was this one or this one. But we never asked questions. We never, we, we were paid by the patient. That was it. So I did a lot of work there, besides to earn some money. And Eugen <laughs> Sader, then started also teaching in the conservatory in Budapest. It was one week in Vienna, two weeks in Budapest. And he must have had a student who couldn't, uh, comp I don't know what, who couldn't write anything well. And so in many ways he st I started composing for somebody whom I didn't know. That was a bit better paid. And so I composed all kinds of things. If he would call me in the morning, well, it's usually it was Tuesday morning, he called me up and said, Herbert, I need uh, a string quartet, last movement, the rondo form, six, eight, <laughs> 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 all the, what, the, the prescription. <laughs> and not later than Saturday, four o'clock. So I sat down in the room. The last movie, the string quartet. But you were also write, uh, writing for cabarets, weren't you? Oh, that was afterwards. That, that was, was that, that was that was way afterwards. So now you are in your twenties, so and we're in the years the, in, the, in the 1920s, and you meet a beautiful young woman. Could you tell me about that? Well, this is this was already at, at the towards the end of the twenties. There were the twenties in Vienna. I mean. The, to explain what the twenties were, it's very difficult, because this was a real revolutionary time. It, I grew up at that time. I mean, I matured in what we call today. We call it, of course, we called it at that time, Red Vienna. See, Austria was a peculiar country. Austria, Vienna was a vast majority social democrat. My uh, the the hinterland of Austria was mostly 
uh, what is called Christian social. That means it was the dominant force there was the Catholic Church. In Vienna, it was not the Catholic Church. In Vienna, it was the, the, the city hall. And the city hall was meant by some very, very exciting people, especially to what we call today Stadtrat. It means, what would they be here? Like states' rights kind of thing? No, no, Stadtrat. That means this is the position, that the title. Title of the okay. people. There were two university professors, Tandler and Breitner, who revamped Vienna. First of all, Vienna became one of the cleanest cities in the world. When it, well, it was in 1919, it was one of the dirtiest. There was no, all the things didn't work. Uh, but what these two men tried to do is to recast the culture, the spirit, the attitude of the working class. It was a pipe dream, but it was a wonderful pipe dream. It was something that in the end didn't work. But the idea, and now they begin to un unwind the past and to try to uncover what happened at that time. And read the end, and now they are writing books about it. Here, I've seen quite a lot of publishing, published uh, <coughs> publications of Red Vienna. Their dream was that the whole cult uh, bourgeois culture, that means the great mainstream of classical music, the great mainstream of classical literature, of the theater, of whatever there is, of, has to be brought to the, to the uh, working classes and raise their whole thing. And this is, of course, the wrong way. I had at that time already big, uh, big uh, uh, fights, really. For instance, they gave symphony concerts for the for the working class. But where they gave it, it was in the same places where the the, uh, the traditional concert houses were. People didn't go there. So, but the audiences that they played for were exactly the same bourgeois audiences. I had a certain a different idea. Uh, Breitner and Tandler built in every district of Vienna. At that time, there were 21 districts. A, a working home. That means where the workers could learn all kinds of things, where they can listen to things, where they can have their own, own uh, movies, for instance, and also their own concerts. So I had made a, a working agreement with the union and started playing concerts in every in every one of these and usually on Sundays in every one of these and they were completely full. That's where the people go. They were where they, where they could come in, in slippers mm -hmm. if they wanted to. Yeah, this was this was the, the exciting twenties. And in, I must say, uh, Vienna became a different kind of city. And first of all, the, the, what they did architecturally for the, for the working class, the, the workers' homes, which I mean, were entirely different from what they were before. Uh, I recall there were uh, delegations from all over the world coming to see what, is, what, they, are, what they do. You see, they, they built in the short time of five or six years, 64,000 apartments. That's not, not, not hay. Now where did they have the money for this after the terrible de deprivation of the earlier? Where well, they had the money? Taxes. So things were getting back to business. Life was... Of was course, of yeah. course. So, but then it, it, it didn't forget, um, when you cut off 
uh, politically a huge country, the strings and the avenues to the capital are being kept open. Uh, the people who uh, wanted to get the final things, they still came to Vienna and bought things. The tourism did still work quite well, because Austria is a beautiful country, where it's most, most beautiful to spend the summer. Did the Zipper family prosper again? Yeah. Now, that was, that was the 20s, but then there was the Depression, so then... Ah, the Depression was, of course, uh, universal. But it was before the Depression, 1927, when I met Trudeau. Yeah. Well, it was very simple. I went, uh, my, uh, my sister was, was still kept as a young lady of... of um, of the class in which she would not go out alone. Which you have to, would have to be chaperoned. And I was very often a chaperone. And she decided she wanted to go to that very famous uh, ball Kunstlerhaus where the, the, <coughs> the big yearly exhibitions are in Vienna. There's a, always a ball in February, and she decided with two of her friends, young young girls, and she asked me to, to, to be her uh, chaperone. How old were you then? I was 23. And at the day before she got ill, so she said, Herbert, these two girls they have made already their costumes. Would you go with them? because they wouldn't be allowed either to go. So I went with them, took a book with me, because I, did, I wasn't dancing, I wasn't doing anything like this, and went in there and sat down in the corner and told the girls, you go and have fun, and every 30 minutes you come here and say you are all right, just that I know what you're doing. And it was about half an hour that I was sitting there and living the book, and I saw Three people coming in, two girls and one boy who was had, had a fantastic costume. And they were not costumed, but seemingly came from somewhere where they were dressed up. And I saw this little girl just uh, arranging her hair. And I saw those hands doing things. I was, electrified by the, by the movement and by the hair and by the way she moved. She was tiny, she was f about four, 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 nine, four, uh, yeah, four, nine. But she didn't grow very much since then. And you were six foot one. Yeah. It's funny. <laughs> but any, anyway, I was approaching her immediately and asked her if she would dance with me, and that was of course. And she started dancing, and she started laughing. And she said, Did you ever dance? I said, no, you are the first one to tell me how to. So we, we practically danced, danced all night. Then I said, the other woman was her sister. So she was in with the sister and as the sister's boyfriend, so they were all under under control, so to say. And when we when I went with the kid home, next I got her address and telephone number of course. I sent her a bundle of notes. And that she never got. She was only fourteen. Nobody said nobody of when she saw that I'm an old man, you know, nine years older. So any anyone who was grown up really take it so seriously, sending her roses. And that, she told me later that she, she couldn't sleep about that. The idea that somebody would send her roses. And that started. Mm -hmm. That was to be the love of your life. Yeah, that was, the, that was the, the, the moment when I thought the relationship between, between the sexes is something different than what I was used to. 
You see, you have no idea what this post was, yeah, life was. It's, it's very difficult to explain. And I'm just, it's also not necessary, but it was a revolution against this very tight bourgeois ethics that were completely untruth. And if you read Arthur Schnitzler, you will know what, what it was all about. And suddenly this was gone. That, that overpowering throne of the Habsburgs was gone. The aristocracy was still there, but they didn't have, to have no say. It was still an entirely di different uh, uh, Spirit, I mean that uh, that uh, demonstrates itself by the women having short, short uh, uh, skirts. You don't know that, of course, anymore. How could you? Skirts, the booby cop, short. You, you all know, but the expressions you know. Yes, yes. This was, of course, an expression of, of the new time, mm -hmm. and. Therefore, we had to also learn a different way, and we were the ones also who, who taught a different way, my brother and I and, and our friends. Talk, please, now about the 30s, uh, after the Depression and, and the political... No, yeah, see, it was during the Depression that I started. The Depression started in 29. And it was at that time that I got my first opera engagement in Germany. And that was a time when radicalism became on every side. a way of life. We became radical socialists, they became radical fascists, and it is not known today that the socialists were still in the plurality all over Europe, but they didn't have the support of the big business, the big industries, the big money sources that still were available. The fascists got the money, we got the voices. So in Germany we realized immediately that Hitler never got more than uh, less than a third of the votes, while the socialists and the communists got twice as many. But whoever had the leadership was very stupid. They never would get together in Germany. However, in the fall of 1930, in November 1932, when I was in Düsseldorf, in a different job already, it looked as if the people would rise up to the fascists rankings. I mean, anyone within his senses would have listened to, at that time to Hitler's speeches, as I did. You actually attended one of his speeches? Oh, I, I attended some of his meetings, some of his rallies, in order to know, to learn what's happening, because I, learning is a profession for me. And he lost there were two elections in this year, one in March, one in November, 32. And he lost in November more than two million votes. Two million votes in America is nothing, but don't forget there are not that many voters. I mean, <coughs> there was about one-fourth of the voters that America has. 
So that was so everybody became relaxed that well the danger is over. Did you feel that way? I thought so too. You did. When you had gone to the meetings that, Hitler, that where Hitler spoke, did you feel a chill? Did you what? What were your feelings as you sat there in those meetings? I can just tell you, it's very difficult to say that in 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 a few words, but. It's very difficult to manipulate me. I'm not easily manipulated by words, by anything. I can be manipulated by a great piece of music, by a great sculpture. I mean, let's say, Rodin's by Zach always get me something. By the way, I didn't tell you that I also, at the same time, <coughs> it's a lot of sculpting, but that's beside the point. Uh, no, I was in, completely immune. I mean, as, as, as immune as, as one possibly could be. But as a Jew, did you sit there and think to yourself, this looked very bad for us? No, I thought it is, it is a disaster. I mean, not just bad, it was like the most disastrous, because uh, what he did was to blame every possible ills of the German uh, situation at that time, the economic situation, the social situation, everything that, that didn't work on the Jews. And this always has helped. If this is unchecked, it has always helped. It's, he knew exactly what uh, what he was doing. But then he lost the election, and you felt okay. And that's then I said, over. "Well, the people they can't get, get they get their mind straightened out a little bit," and he lost. But then, of course, the German government didn't didn't in any way uh, work itself out of, of that disaster. The uh, communists and the, the social democrats didn't want to join forces, which they could have done very easily. So Hindenburg, the, the, the old man, was persuaded to try it with Hitler. Continuing with Dr. Herbert Zipper, talking to Sandy Jacobson in Los Angeles, California, in English. It's 9th of February, 1995, day number three. All right, so you you came back to Vienna. Were you in yeah. Vienna? Then in, in January, on January 30th, 1933, Hitler came to power, and that was, that was for me by end of Germany. Of course, I stayed until June because I couldn't leave my students. Conservatory before the end of it. What was that like living in Dusseldorf with Hitler in power as a Jew? Were you looking over your shoulder every day? More than that. Twice I left by night. I was warned. I had quite a number of, of nice friends there who were Nazis, but who knew very well uh, and who didn't want me to get into trouble. So once I left for Westphalia, and the other time I left for Holland, just for a few days, until the so-called air was clear. No, I saw I saw the most terrible things. I mean, not not of course a friend of mine was shot immediately, uh, who was an editor of a newspaper. Uh, yeah. The worst thing, on one of the worst sides of my life, that I was May 10th, when the, the book burning started. That was a terrible experience. And when you see this, then you know this is really the greatest danger that they are facing. The 
because when they start when they start burning books, they soon will start burning people. So you stayed in Dusseldorf. I stayed in Dusseldorf until June, until the school was over, school year was over in June, and went to Vienna. And there I was immediately grabbed by some of my, some of our schoolmates and some friends that they started that had started in Vienna. Those subterranean political cabarets. Cabaret. Cabaret. Mm -hmm. and that's where I started working as as composer, mainly as composer. I also sometimes played the piano as pianist and devoted a great deal of my life at that time for uh, composing music for the political arena. Would you consider yourself at that time politically active? Yeah. That's the first time when I became politically active. And I did also, I was a bit active in Germany too, but I was in foreigners and it was difficult to, to, to identify yourself with the, with the Germans. It's always a bit difficult. I wrote to my mother, I wrote to my mother once, uh, working in Germany is heaven, living in Germany is hell. That was at that time, it is not, of course, entirely different. Mm -hmm. But at that time, it, living there for, for a foreign Jew was not a very simple thing. Mm -hmm. So in 33, June of 33, you returned to Vienna. Yeah. And then, and you worked in the cabaret. That's right. There were quite a few. So between 33 and 38, you just kind of... Uh, no, I was, uh, I, I was in Russia for that time. I did some, some guest conducting. I was in Russia, I was in Italy. I went to, I was in England. Summer 36, I was conducting in the Covent Garden, the Russian Ballet. And so I did all kinds of, of I, I didn't give up my work entirely, but as a composer, I really worked practically all the time. Whatever I did with my, with my uh, pencil was for the, for the cabaret. When you would go to England, did you ever think, maybe I better stay here? This is a question of, of family uh, loyalties. I didn't want to stay in England. I wanted to stay in Russia. And if I would have been in Russia. Why Russia? See, I got that contract to stay, to, to take over the, the, the Stalinov. So there's a rather big city in, uh, south of Moscow, not far from Moscow. They had a new radio station, a new orchestra, and I would have said, I would have, I was engaged as the director of the orchestra. And I went just in '36 for Christmas vacation to Vienna uh, to pick up two, and then marry her. But. Then this immediately after that, the, the Stalin, uh, the Stalin problems started when he, when people were killed, when people, so they changed the contract. They wanted me to go to Khabarov, nowhere Khabarovsk is, in East Siberia. <laughs> of course, you see. <laughs> <laughs> to tell anybody in Vienna, you're going to East Siberia, are you going to, to, to be in exile for yourself? Of course, it wouldn't have been so bad, because Khabarovsk is a huge city, with a beautiful opera house. You know where the Russians go, there's a good, great opera house, there's something going on. <coughs> <coughs> Artistically, always something first rate. 
So I did it. And no, I rejected that, that contract. And it was, I mean, to think that I would, I would go away from my family, for, for everything that actually, I mean, I was a European. To go to Eastern Siberia, it was unthinkable. Today I would think differently. So then now comes the Anschluss. Can you tell me about that, how it felt to be this You see, my problem was this. That I saw it. I lived it. And although my whole family knew it, but knowledge and knowing are two different things. Knowledge you can learn by, from books and from lectures and from pictures and from whatnot. But knowledge means you have lived it. That means both your intellectual and your emotional person has, was involved. When that emotional thing is not, has not been experienced, then knowledge doesn't help you. The knowing doesn't help. So there was a difference between my people. They all didn't uh, live what I lived in Germany. They didn't experience what this was, really. Oh, it won't be that bad. You know that. To, to, uh, I wanted to leave the same night. Mm -hmm. You wanted to leave the end of the night of the election? The night. And my people voted me down unanimously. Your family. Your family except my father, who was in England at the time. Why was he there? I'm busy. Mm -hmm. And I was just outvoted, and I wouldn't leave my, my family alone. I, I think that I neglected to ask you to say, besides your mother and father, you, tell me about your head. There was my sister, her husband, and her two children. There was my brother, Walter, there was my, and there was my brother, Otto, there, who was here, had this BMW zipper. So, I mean, there were, and this was a pretty sizable family, and I couldn't just leave them alone. Besides, those my brothers were, were not made to go around and get their papers going and pay their taxes and what not, and we need all these things. I could handle it. I knew I could handle it. They were relying on me. And my father, my father who called up the same night when it happened, and said, I'm going immediately, I'm going, I'm, I will be there tomorrow. So I said, Father, if you come back, I will never talk to you again. He understood fully. I didn't know whether the, the, the the uh, telephone was already marked or not. But you suspected that? I suspected that I wanted to be careful. He said, Father, if you come back, I will never, never talk to you again. And he understood. And the, what was the message you were sending him? That was the message. That, that you was might that not be able to speak to him again. No, the message was that don't come. Right. Because if you come back, I may not be able to speak to you again. Something may Nobody, happen. Nobody. I know what would have happened to him. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what was happening to him. Mm -hmm. No, he immediately sought us, and I was very emphatic about it. I mean, yeah, my voice, he knew that, that's what he told me later on, that uh, he knew that I knew a little bit more about this situation. There were others who, who uh, for instance, when Shushnik went on February was it February 12th or 13? I don't know. Just a month before the Anschluss, when Shushnik <coughs> lose me, went to Berchtesgaden to see Hitler, I she knew this. Mm -hmm. I see that is that's end. The, the, the father of my of one, one of my of my closest friend, Eric Simon, Ernst Simon, who is was a very wealthy businessman called me up and said, Herbert, how do you see the situation? So I told him, Ernst Simon, if I would be you, 
I would pack up immediately and leave the country for good. That's what he did. He had a month's time. And he left and he was... He scared. left four or five days later. Hmm. But you couldn't get your own family to go? No. So then, so now it's, it's a different Vienna, isn't it? Well, it has changed. No, I meant then. 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 Yeah, it's overnight. The overnight. You have no, no conception of what can happen if a city that was for nearly 2,000 years the capital of a country, small, larger, very large, maybe smaller, but still the center of a country that created its own culture with a certain number of people. That created, that created and kept this culture. You see, people like Richard Strauss with his operas couldn't be successful in a, con in a city where there was not a huge population that supported it. It is, it is not just the, the creation of artists, it's the creation that they need to address themselves to people who try to understand. What happened to Vienna overnight was that it suddenly and immediately became a German provincial city, which it never was before, in which the hub of the city, those who kept its culture, was suddenly a bunch of outlaws. Now that is not an exaggeration. Those 180,000 Jews of Vienna became overnight complete outlaws. They could be robbed, they could be mishandled, they could be uh, killed, as they would. They could do everything could happen to them. They had no recourse to any legal authority, to the police, to a, even a lawyer, to nothing. They were just exposed to a complete bunch of ruffians who took charge. Let's say the next morning, my, the son of, of our concierge down there, the house, uh, housekeeper, what we call it here. You mean like the, the, in the apartment building? Yeah. yeah. And when he came up, the son and said to my brother, the key. My mother said, what the key? He said, well, the key of your car. It's mine now. And my brother said, what? And then he made like this, you know, till he saw that he had, a, he had a gun here. And my brother gave him the key. That was it. And people could, uh, could uh, stop you on the street, kill you there, and everybody would look, look away from you. So, I mean, uh, sadly, and now you must not forget that 80%, let's say, of the law profession was in Jewish hands. There were 186 full-time journalists in Vienna with the various newspapers appointed. It's a large number, of which 136 were Jewish. So, I mean, the Jewish penetration of the cultural, of the uh, intellectual life, of the, uh, of the professional life was so strong that, and that also created, of course, that anti-Semitism about those who, who did not achieve that. See, and what anti-Semitism creates is that th since Jews were not allowed to apply, to uh, acquire property for centuries, they had to find another way to stay alive. The other way was just to live by their wits. So to sharpen their wits was a thing that in babyhood you had to start. That's why they could be good as mathematicians, as, as writers, as, as what, any kind, which, which, you, which you could take with yourself. It's the mind. And that's the way how, they, how those, all those uh, people who could get out lived. 
I left, I came to Paris with, with $2.50 in my pocket. Everything was taken away from me. Let's go back, that's later in the story. Yeah. When, when you, what happened to your friends? You, you were active in Vienna all your life. Did people shun you now? No friends, I mean, those who were not non-Jewish, they wouldn't dare to call me. They wouldn't dare to come to see us. In fact, uh, during the following two months, I hardly ever slept at home, because I was, I was suspect. I mean, not, be, not because I was Jewish only, because I was a, I was a radical on the other side. And as such, I was suspect, so I didn't, I always, when I went home, I called up my mother, if the air is free, she said, no, don't come. That means there was some, something going on, which, so I usually, and that's the only one that, the, the only time that I was home, overnight, it was just stupid. I was napped, of course. The one, okay. So what happened? That night I was taken to the police and from the police to another police station and said I was taking my, my <coughs> data. You were taken with your brother, were you? Yeah, I was taken to my, my brother, went down to a, to a school that was by the Nazis empty for the person. There were a few, a few hundred, quite a few hundred people there and then we were shipped to Dachau. Tell me how it happened that you, you were taken with your two brothers, but one brother was, Otto was sick. Yeah, Otto was sick. So and what I, did you do? I went, you see, the, the people who watched us, that means who, who the, the, this was not German police yet, it was Austrian police. And I was still an Austrian, you know, and I went to that policeman and said, you know, that my brother cannot stay here. He has to go to the hospital right away. So he came to me and said, listen, if he dies here, and he might, he might die here within the next two days, then I make you responsible, then you are with So that was still <laughs> very old Austrian. I mean, it was, it was just funny. I mean, it was my last act of, of Austrian superiority. And they let him go, and let him go out. No, they, they put him to a hospital, they found out that he was, and that's the way he got free. And he was saved. Then. Yeah. But you and Walter then were put on a train yeah. to go. Now tell me about that train ride. No, I don't want to talk about that again. Just tell me briefly about how... It was the most beastly, most terrifying, most ugly, most inhuman, most ghastly experience of my life. The ride itself. The ride itself. Those 13 hours from Vienna to Dachau were the, the worst thing that I can experience. I mean, the, where I learned, again, I said after some hours I began to learn. When the shock, the shock went off, I started to learn. When I learned how beastly people can be uh, made, to what extent they can be manipulated to become worse than animals. I shouldn't even say the word to use as animals. Animals are probably very kind. Mm -hmm. Were these uh, Germans or Austrians? They were German Germans. And how do you feel that the Germans themselves were manipulated? These soldiers who took them yeah. on the train. Yeah, they were, they were manipulated the same way as I explained to you, by, by the hatred, by, by the obvious thing. You see, Hitler was very clever in one way to have the obvious as the thing itself means because there were Jewish bankers, Jewish people who owned department stores, the 
tell them. That's the way they rob the people. I mean, obvious things to tell them that all their ills, all their difficulties, all their problems, this was this, what I call the middle, middle slime of people. I mean, who were half educated, or let's say a third educated, who didn't know, really had not the ability to think, but for, the, by, for them, the the, the easy solutions. You had some people here in the Congress who are very, very similar. But you, you talked about, you wrote that the, that the uh, German soldiers that were transporting you, they were, they were, they were, their behavior was structured. Yeah, entirely. But they were not soldiers. They were SS people. They were the, they were the storm troopers. Mm -hmm. They were the Hitler guards. They were the people who were taught from childhood on, who already had 10 years of good, good education from there. They were manipulated, you see. But they acted in a certain way on the train. They, they all acted, they, they all didn't have their own language. They all talked the same language. They, they, even in the sentence structures were exactly the same. They said, I mean, I realized immediately, this is not, these are poor people. Uh, really terribly poor people who have been made beasts. Mm -hmm. That was their profession. So you arrived in Dachau in May of 1938. Yeah, in the last day of May 38. Um, the, you write of so many experiences in Dachau. Will you talk just a little bit about the, the, your immediate impression the prison. The immediate impression well, it was one of those ugly places, you know, where you, where you are not uh, dealt with as a human being, but with something that is despised, is, is a really uh, organized to use Lose, to lose your self-respect, to lose what you ever have been. And it took quite some time until they began to find some positive lesson. And my quest for knowledge, for learning, was one thing that I realized very soon, he came there immediately with a shawl. But they were not only shorn of our hair from top to bottom, but they were shorn of our entire past. What we have been through our education, through our social standing, through our friends, so the, the way we, how we lived, that all fell apart. We didn't have even names, we had only numbers. So what we, what we were facing each other is naked humanity. You were what you were. It's, it's a piece of, of human. And there you could see how low this can go in the, to a depth which you never imagined, but also to a magnificence which you have never imagined before. Both sides. This was the great lesson of Dachau, and also the lesson of the place of what in, the, in this naked humanity, what the arts mean. I cannot talk much longer, uh, two hours. I need you to tell me a few things about these, about your experience. I have to hear about, about the what? Arts. Where are we on the tape? Uh, 27, we've changed now. Continuing with Dr. Herbert Zipper, talking to Sandy Jacobson in Los Angeles, California, in English, 9th of February, 1995, and State of Dr. Zipper, please talk about, you referred to the magnificence of human beings. How, how can you have magnificence in a concentration 
Oh, sure. Those who are the magnificent ones, they light up immediately. These are the people who have the immediate and strong urge to help others, to save them from the worst, and the worst in the magnificent people's minds is to commit suicide. It means to do, do just exactly what they want us, us to do. To help others not to give up. To help others to have a sense of humor. This is what I call the leader of men, who really have the gift sometimes if they have never done it before. I mentioned in the book one person, Mr. Tillinger. I remember his name so well. But of course, there were others. Little Tillinger, who was a 50-year-old uh, uh, seller of second-rate vegetables in a little subterranean shop in Vienna in a, in a second-rate district, who ached out his life by selling these things and wrapping them in newsprint, who didn't go beyond third grade or fourth grade, who had a hard time uh, writing, reading. This Tillinger became suddenly a great man who helped, I'm sure there are t uh, scores of people who owe their life to Tillinger, who helped them to grow up and to be themselves and to have, and not to give in and, and, and to describe what these, these gangsters are. Uh, I mean, this speech, and he taught me, he, I didn't know I can do that. Talk about how you conducted you see, Tillinger became one of my teachers there. I mean, uh, teachers, uh, not, not that he had lessons with him, but uh, teachers that I saw what he was doing and how he was doing it. And that this, this is the way, this is the way to, to, to li live there, to not think about ever getting uh, out alive. You see, this was the, the thing that I learned very soon, that I had no idea I will get out of this mess ever alive. So I have to live here, and now I'm going to make that life as livable as possible. And I learned in the, in the, from the very beginning by reciting poetry, which I had on quite a body of poetry by, by heart. But that's a question of, of my, was my question of education. It's nothing special. And then I saw that this poetry began to mean a great deal to many people who have never listened to poetry or have never read poetry. You stood outside of your barracks and recited That's right. This was in the first or first or second night. And people came and gathered around. Gathered around and, and their whole spirit started suddenly different. You see, what it is really, it is not conscious. But what it really is, is that suddenly they heard some human words, some human expression of excellence, and they began to understand it. And this excellence really made them feel also like human beings again. Their self-respect began to increase. That's, I mean, that's, I presume that it was this. As one factor, at least, that is this language that they suddenly understood that was not their everyday language. And the same thing is with music. It is, it is, we forget 
that the great ex musical expressions are communications with oneself. This cannot be replaced by anything else. You cannot replace a great musical line, what it does to you, by anything else. Therefore, it is an, a, a communication that is irreplaceable. And people forget that. And people who do not, are not being taught early in life that this great communication is one side of life which must also take part in the daily life, in, in the natural everyday life. That this is not something special which you do on certain occasions, but it is part of, of the, the need for something which nothing else can fill it but the great, um, the great expressions of music. So you... And so if you do, do be a able to do something which expresses their, the, the inner emotion, like it's difficult to say these words because it's, otherwise we wouldn't need music. Uh, that this need is an innate one in the human race, regardless where they come from. And that drove me to, to write music and to make those music instruments with my friends. There were some ex extraordinary people there. How did you make musical instruments in a concentration? Listen, first of all, we had two or three first-rate music uh, instrument makers in, as, as uh, one of the prisoners from Munich. They couldn't do, of course, they didn't have the right tools. They didn't. But we could make some things that sounded like music. Mostly string instruments in other cases where you put a string on top of it. Where'd you get the string? Well, there was... Did you read it in the book? Yes, but the people watching the tape didn't. Oh, I see. Well, the, I, I saw one of those SS men very soon who was shouting like mad, but, but never doing anything mad, anything bad. And one day I thought, this is, must be a communist spy or something like this. Because the behavior, also the, his knowledge of words, things, words that were different from those. I said, this is a socialist, this is not a communist. So I approached him one day, I said, I dare it. I said, listen, we are making some music instruments. I said, so under my breath. And we needed some strings. And I described the strings. He didn't say a word. But a few days later, I found a whole bunch of usable strings under my pillow. That's the way I got strings. That's the way we made music. Where did you make the music? Uh, in an uh, abandoned latrine, with ten toilets. I could see, I, see, I could see a movie, uh, so uh, people <laughs> sitting on the empty toilets <laughs> so on the floor. So how could you get, I mean, you couldn't get everybody in at one time. No, we got, the most we could get is about 25 to 30 people. So what would you so we played, we played a short program of 15 minutes all afternoon. You would play one performance and then these... Yeah, the, the, they went out and they come in and there were also people watching that, whether there is an SS patrol coming. When did you do this? On Sundays. It was the only time you could do it, Sunday afternoon. It was your, your so-called free time. Did you have musicians there? Or did you teach people how to play certain instruments? Listen, my dear, we had at least 30 or 40 excellent musicians who were in jail there. They, they were mostly string players, but they used this, I mean, really talented people, professionals. Now, of course, I worked with professionals there, because they didn't have to teach them anything. They, they could sight read, they could immediately 
we, we had a rehearsal at the immediately after one o'clock. A rehearsal of about half an hour, just go through with it. it. What I wrote on this paper that they gave me, it was, it was very clear always. There was always a discussion, do you mean G-sharp or G-sharp flat? So you would write out the, the arrangements for each instrument? I would write the score. I would write immediately the parts. I didn't have to, to, to write the score. So I learned, also what I learned there is to rely on my memory and not to use, have to use an instrument to know what it sounds, should sound like. So you can press yourself to all kinds of things that you didn't learn. Um, that was not in your, in, in your curriculum. But when the need arises, your potentials come to your help. What about Dachau Lied, the, the Dachau song? Tell me how that got written. Well, I didn't, didn't write it down at all. That was too dangerous, to write words and music together. So I didn't write it at all. Both Jura and I, we did not, we did not write the thing down. We Tell me about the, the, the words to it. How, who wrote the words to it? You're you are a soifer. Actually, you have to wash your hands, brush the microphone. You are a soifer. Who was a, one of the writers with whom I did work already in Vienna, and he wrote a wrote a. I, the, the story is very simple. We, when we were both at that time horses on a on a uh, cement uh, cement truck, and. We went through that door of Dachau there every day, many times. There was this huge inscription, Arbeit macht frei, uh, a work makes free. And uh, one day I got so mad, it was a hot focus day, I said, you are, this is really too much, that they, to, to write this thing on top of this. By the way, I got yesterday from from the Holocaust Museum in, in Washington, one of their, their, their weekly. There's one, one picture of Auschwitz, where it's also very low, very large, the same, the same uh, uh, Arbeit macht frei. So he said, you know, said, you know, we should try this song. I said, okay, he said, I always think of it. And about a few days later, he came and recited it to me. And I memorized it in, on, one of, on, on one day, on one trip. I have quite a good memory. I can memorize things, especially if somebody tells it to me. And uh, I think it was two or three days later, I, I sang it to him, and he said, oh, that sounds good to me. And then I taught it to one of the musicians, and accompanied to two guitarists, and then we left for Buchwald. That's all I knew about it. Mm -hmm. you know but that many, th there's a p peculiar thing of, of, of some things. You, I, I just wrote it for the people, some kind of, of resistance, sometimes to give them hope. And, but if things begin to arouse the imagination of people, in whatever it is, they begin to have their own life. Things, Dachau, the Dachau song had, had its own life without, without me, without its song, and, and lived by the word of mouth on, from, from east to west, from south to north, in every concentration camp, and later also in Russia. I, uh, the numbers of, of, of arrangements I got very peculiar. Um, let's talk a little bit about Buchenwald. Um, you had you had a terrible job there in Buchen Buchenwald. You worked, as you called it, in the Eau de Cologne. Uh, oh, see the. the yeah, cleaning, cleaning of the latrines. You see, in, in Buchenwald, the, 
the really horrifying thing was that there was no water. Absolutely no water, period. We didn't have any water. We couldn't wash, we couldn't have cleaning our teeth. There was no, we couldn't clean anything. There was no water. So therefore, there were no toilets. There were only open latrines, that means deep, uh, deep uh, ditches that were, and there were some wood planks on, on the side of it. That's where people did their business. And of course, when you think that there were over 10,000 people in, in the house, that there, was a lot, and there were only two or three latrines there. So they were pretty full every day. And we, had, we had the business of, of emptying them. We had these five gallon, I think it must have been five gallon. Yeah, it was about 10 liters, something like that. Cans that you had on, on streaks, let it down, filled it up, and walked with it. And of course, on the sides, the thing began. So after a couple of days, we started to smell from far away. And my brother coined the word, the eau de Cologne. You, um, you had a night there where you had to stand all night. Can you talk about that, the night in December where? I decided, <coughs> in December, it was December 1938. It was very cold. It was sub, sub zero temperature. The, at five o'clock, the, the appell place had to be filled. We came in there, and the, the head man there told us that two prisoners escaped, and that we have to stand there until they are captured. See, this is one thing which people do not understand, and even Hannah Arendt does not, didn't understand, that there was something worse than death, that is torture. And that what anyone did, every one of the 10,000 people had to suffer for it. They didn't, that was not known, but I can only emphasize it. This was what, what many of us did not even contemplate it, to do anything against the rules of the because we knew very well that it will be uh, will be a, a dreadful thing for everyone else. So there we stood from five o'clock to next day twelve o'clock noon for 19 hours. Um, many people died of frostbite, of freezing. many old people, especially very old people who, who might say that somebody who is 60 years old. They died and most of the people had very heavy frostbites. It was a very, very peculiar night. If you, I would recommend that you read Bruno Bettelheim's uh, description of that night, because he does a phenomenal job on the, at, to the towards the last hours, how discipline suddenly disintegrated, how well, that was a. a a kind of hilarity that he created. That even the, the SS, everything, something it completely changed during that time. How people just said, "Okay, I'm going to die and die." So, so what? It was, it was a, a, a peculiar. But as I said, when I read it. And actually, Bruno told me again about it. Uh, that was the best description 
of what of the spirit that it created. Something entirely different than what it what could be expected. It was really terrible, but again I learned something which I would have never learned otherwise. What? How one can control oneself. And do things oneself that one didn't know one could do. Control one's blood, well, blood circulation. How to do that? Just by not stopping to move for one second any part of your body so that you can see it, not see it from the outside but that you still do it. And that's what I did for the 19 hours. Yeah, everybody can do it. If you have the goal, you see, I was afraid of my, of my hands because I, uh, for a great part, I lived by my hands. If they, if they are really, you become useless, as many of them became. So I, I thought, well, I'm anyway, I'm going to, I'm going to try to not to stop the the movement that gave me gave me the, the possibility of having the blood circulation, and, and that didn't get any faster either. Your brother did. My brother did heavy mm-hmm. for three or four months. He couldn't wear one shoe. There was a man, a Jew, who was an informant. Uh, Z. And they, the people in your barracks wanted to kill him, and you wouldn't let them. Talk about that a little bit. No, that's not wrong. That's wrong. Nobody wanted to kill him. The, 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 the SS wanted to kill him. Because he, he, uh, he informed on the SS. That was his stupidity. He was a Viennese lawyer who didn't want to get through that, that terrible work of Dachau and Buchenwald. And in the very, very beginning, decided to become an informer. And we knew it very soon. And we had to stay away from him because it was a great danger to talk to him. Even. No, he uh, he went so stupidly to the uh, to the SS heads and told them about the business deals that the SS was doing, and they of course went immediately back and and, and tried to kill him, and that's what they did they finally. But you had you, you wrote about a time where the people in your barracks were, were attacking him. And don't do this because you will... No, I didn't say that. That was something else. Mm-hmm. No, he was... The thing is, he, uh, Jura and I wanted to get him. He was heavily, heavily beaten and wounded. And I mean, he was... Really, and he became suddenly a human being asking for his mother. And neither Jura nor I couldn't stand that. So we took him on the, on, the, on the stretcher and brought him to the, uh, the prisoner's hospital. But the prisoner wouldn't, wouldn't take him. That's it. That's the story. They refused. So we put him back to our barracks. And there we had to leave him outside on the, on, on not, not outside in the outside, no, but outside of, of our rooms. Our, and that's where he was killed by the SS, with sand sacks. A nice way to die. Something that you did back in Dachau, I thought was very funny. One day you decided that you worked quite enough. You'd been a horse, as you put it, quite enough. So you got yourself a measuring stick. Oh, you mean the yardstick? Oh. Tell that story. <laughs> yardstick? Well, I found that yardstick. It's just that some somebody l- uh, lost it on the thing. And I thought this is a good a good tool, a tool for freedom. 
because um, the Prussian spirit is a spirit that has to be left, that cannot be explained. Anything that is, uh, looks like official, anything that looks like uh, something that has been ordered to do, that has nothing to do with the work of prisoners, is correct. It's uh, that, that Prussian spirit. You cannot, uh, you cannot uh, explain it exactly. So, I, but I have learned it. So I took that next morning, from the word, went uh, went away, and started measuring every distance, whenever I saw an officer coming up. And they passed by and didn't pay any attention to me, because I was measuring something with an official. Tool. So now we'll, we'll go ahead as much as I would love to hear the details. I know you're tiring. You talk about your father was in England and he was able to arrange for exit. Yeah, he was in England, but then he went to Paris. And how was he able to, he was able to arrange? You see, the thing was that the rules were, this was, took quite some time until, until the, you, the rules of, of, the, uh, the, the, of ex ex the exodus of uh, Jews was allowed. It was, I think, by December or January that these rules were promulgated, announced. What's the name of the man who was then uh, was hanged in, in Israel? What's uh, his name? Forget the name. Did the German, uh, the German, who, you mean German Schindler? No, the, uh, uh, what name did you say? Schindler. No, no, not Schindler. The man who was hanged. Oh, Eichmann. Eichmann, yeah. Eichmann was in charge in Vienna uh, about the whole thing, and he got the rules from Germany, and it was then known that one could get out of a concentration camp if, if one was able to immigrate into a foreign, a foreign country outside of Europe and outside of the United States. That means it could have been South America, it could have been Asia, or so forth. And my father, I think he bribed some of, of officer of the Guatemala. Uh, embassy in Paris to have two visas issued for my father and for me. And this was sent to the Gestapo in Vienna. You know what the Gestapo was. And then they issued a release for, for us to leave. That was the way we could get out. Of course, the moment the war started, it was, it was over. So this was... Yes, uh, we continue on with Dr. Herbert Zipper, talking to Sandy Jacobson, Los Angeles, California, in English, 9th of February, 1995, tape number five. So your father got you uh, the exit visas, and where did you and your brother go? We went first to Vienna. Mm -hmm. We had to go to Vienna. I mean, the, the order was to go from, this, from the uh, train station directly to the head office of the Gestapo. And okay. there we had to start at bargaining for how many days they could let us be in Vienna, because we had so many things to, to, to bring in order until they finally let us out in taking away everything. I mean, if we had known, if we had known that, that this is the procedure, we could have gone earlier. So how long did you stay in Vienna? We stayed. Vienna, 20 days, I think. And from there, where did you go? We went to Paris. Mm -hmm. And you met your family there? We met the family, the whole family was there at that time. <coughs> that was the first time you were reunited with the whole yeah. family? Yeah, that was the years. first time. It didn't last long. Because I got a job in Manila. Why Manila? What was the appeal of Manila? Because Trull was there. 
So uh, there were uh, many circumstances that, that I cannot explain. Mm -hmm. the, the head of the Academy of Music and the head of the orchestra in Manila was a Viennese whom I knew and who suddenly died of a heart attack. A competitive young man, I think he was 48. He was about, uh, he was much older than I. And he happened to accompany to Louise the orchestra on her, her ballet. On one composite, on one uh, whole uh, series of composition that I wrote for her. And she was very successful at that. And it was just a few months before he died. So my name was known in Manila. And she was asked where I could be found. And she happened just to know that I, because I sent her a telegram. And so I went to Manila. Mm -hmm. They offered me the job. And there you and Trudel. And there. Uh, you were together and you were married there. You had, um, you were also arrested by the Japanese. Oh yes, sure. Why? Because I made speeches in Manila. What kind of speeches? Attacking the Axis. You know what the Axis was? The Axis was the uh, uh, Berlin, Rome, Tokyo Axis. I attacked, I attacked him on, on cultural, on the on pieces of, of culture mishandling and I made speeches that, that appeared on the front page of newspapers. So the Japanese arrested you and took you to prison? Yeah. No, not to prison. They took me to police prison. Where they, what they called the enemy number one was, was uh, assembled. How were the Japanese different as jailers than the Germans? Yeah, of course, you see, it was not a normal jail. It was a police prison, and some people were shot, and some people were, I'm sure, mistreated. They never touched me. They interrogated me for, for a whole month every day. And but there was not that kind of manipulation that the Germans did. They were always different. Also, there was one lieutenant, Yamamoto was his name, who was of one of the high aristocratic families, who himself was once badly, badly injured by the high Japanese of horses, because he was too well educated. He spoke English very well, spoke French quite well, and played chess very well. So I played chess with him every day, and there I learned a great deal about Japanese society, which is another field which I'm now being asked a great deal about, because I learned things from him that you don't read in books. You see, this is entirely different. The Japanese fascism, even as it is headed today, is completely different. Okay. Completely different from European one. Uh, fascism is, is something that every person feels directly. It is a fascism of group pressure not government pressure or some other pressure. It is group pressure, and of, of which one is it's difficult or even impossible to escape. It's a very difficult, a different thing. It's, it's very highly intelligent and not less insidious. Mm -hmm. 
why did the Japanese release you? Release me? Because they did, didn't get the, uh, they didn't know, <coughs> <coughs> they didn't get to any way what they wanted me to do. Because I had always a, a way out to tell them that they could do that. What did they want you to do? They wanted me to reorganize the orchestra again and to use it for propaganda purposes. Sure, that's what everybody does. And I told them, as long as, as I told them, as long as they keep me in here, I don't know, I cannot promise you. But uh, you just promise. I said, no, I said, no, that's against my conscience. I cannot promise you anything which I know, I don't know that I can keep it. So they let you. But then they told me that I would be killed. I told him, he says, well, everybody has to die one day. You just do what you have to do, I do what I have to do. So they, they really wanted me to kill them in the end. I knew that when, when things become bad, when, when the Americans landed and later, I told my wife, and now we are going to move again. That no one is going to know where we are going. Stay. Because after they released you, then you. Yeah, they out. watched me. They watched me. They watched me to find out that, that I tried to to do all kinds of things that they wanted me to do, and they couldn't do it. So then, once the Americans were on in, in the Philippines, then you felt. That no, I knew that, that they are going to anyone who was in their prison once, they killed. Mm -hmm. Many, many of my friends were killed that way. You, you became active and you uh, became a kind of a spy yourself, didn't you? You can call it that. Yeah, you can call it that. It means I was asked by a group of, of Philippine Chinese people who, especially the Chinese who, had, who knew what, what the Japanese were, were doing in China, in, in China. They knew about Nanjing. They knew about those horrible things that they had. So they were the most reliable ones, and they wanted to do whatever. They kept the radio going and asked me to help them to organize it and to get news, write the news for them, write what, what they should broadcast, and help them. So I did all kinds of, of unsavory things that. I felt I had to do. You saw, um, you heard that, that the Japanese were going to to uh, issue propaganda about Americans coming in, and so you got a hold of some money, some peso bills, and you were writing, talk about the war, and writing on money. Yeah, that's what I did with my friend, Benito Legarda. Sure, we, it's, uh, we, we printed this up one Sunday afternoon. And on, on that Mickey Mouse, what they called Mickey Mouse money, and dropped them. What did you write on the money? We wrote them that the, the Japanese are painting six of their bombers with American insignias in order to bomb Manila to arouse the anger against the Americans, the population. And they they, they were. They became an, an, a collector's item, these centavos that we have printed. How many did you do? One thousand. Uh -huh. You wrote that, you hand wrote that on, set, on one We set. didn't wrote, we didn't write. No, no, I found a way, found a way to, to, to print it. Mm -hmm. on the stand, first we did it on a stencil, then we, and then we used, we used a, what do you I call it? Yeah, I roll it. And, and dried it on a table in the office of, of the Ghana. It worked very hard, but we got a thousand done that could be easily read, and he dropped it on North, North Manila, that is north of the Pasig River, and I dropped it on the bicycle. I made a hole in my pocket and dropped it on the, the streets and on markets. And you foiled the plan, didn't you? Oh, the, the, the day, next day they had an editorial in the newspaper. 
a stupid American propaganda. That, of course, since everybody know, knew it. You have and there was also a funny story you tell about you watched from the window of your house as a Japanese uh, ammo truck was stuck. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was fun for you. But it was <coughs> an ammunition truck with, with a Japanese driver and an officer next to him. And they, they got stuck. And I don't think that, you see, they were not, they were no mechanics. They were just, they could drive a truck. But they, when the truck got stuck, they didn't, uh, obviously the battery got off. So they started opening it up and hammering and so forth. And, they, and of course, immediately a, a, um, a Philippine mechanic came there, the Philippines are first rate mechanics, who said he's going to help them. Oh, he's going to help them. He did all kinds of things and gave them into their hands. And while he was doing it, the population gathered around. And, and that was immediately a big, a big to do. I mean, there were dozens of people around it. And some young Filipinos jumped up and this started emptying the truck. Entering the back of the truck. The back of the truck. All the ammunition and they disappeared <laughs> into the houses, gone. <laughs> Finally, the mechanic said, said to them, a battery. So he, he got the battery and put it in. The car started running. They were extremely thankful, bowed deeply, and we drove off in an empty truck. You, um, as you said, Listen, my dear. I say, I just do one more story about yeah. the boy, about the boy in the rug. Boy, in what? The boy that you wrapped up in the rug. Do you want to see the rug? We, well, we will see. First, tell the story, and then I'll let you go get the rug, and I'll let you go after. But well, it was in the first days of the of the liberation. It must have been about fifty years, three or four days ago. And in front of my, of, of my apartment, my house, actually occupied the whole house, uh, there was a, a boy lying, looking dead, practically. And I went near that, it was in the evening, and we heard that he was breathing still. In fact, he was breathing very loud. He had a hole here in the chest and a hole in the back. So it must have been a, a bullet that went through him, where the heart is. But the heart was, was pumping nicely. But he was very weak and still blood. He couldn't talk. So my friend and Lu Lu Lucio, who was called Lucio at that time, is a real different name, but he was with me on that group. Uh, he decided to take him, we have to, to save that boy. So I uh, took, went upstairs and took one carpet of mine, one of those Chinese carpets, and we wrapped him in that and carried him around. And for this next few weeks, we kept him as our mascot. And as we found out later, when we could get him to the, to the, American uh, doctor who was next to the company, uh, he found out that the bullet struck the ribs and went along the ribs and on the other side out, but never touched the inside. But the heart, the, the lung, was punctured. And therefore he had a pneumothorax. That's why he was whistling out of his home. But you took that boy with you on every move, didn't you? Wrapped up in the rug, you kept him alive. No, sure. That's what you do. I mean, that's, that is a, a very natural reaction. You kept him alive. Dr. Zipper, at the end of this story, this incredible, extraordinary story, what is the message? What value is there in what you've 
learned of the suffering and deprivation that you've seen, what what message do you give the person who's watched this video and, and who said, what did you learn? It's very difficult to put into one sentence, my dear. Because there are too many things. things. You learn too many things. But the one important thing is that you learn through adversity. No, adversity is not the right word. Through real uh, through the real let me think a little bit difficult to put as a message. The tragic thing is that the best in the human race comes forward when it is in real trouble. The humdrum of every day buries it. And that sometimes he should be exposed at least by any of the artists artif art of the art ways to experience the real problems of humanity. Unless we we really experience them these problems, we are not really human. We become human when we find that we all actually face the same dangers, the same problems, and that we don't fool, about, fool ourselves that we are immune to them. You can see that when President Kennedy was shot. In this 72 hours afterwards, when the whole drama became really sunk into the, to the whole nation, this nation became magnificent in every respect. If you recall, you may not recall that radio and television, nothing that was trivial was broadcast. Suddenly the people listened to magnificent music, poetry and whatnot. Because there was something really grievous happened to all of them. And this is again and again I recall in life when, this, when, it, when the worst happens to him, to us, the best in us comes forward. You see, after the, that Northridge earthquake, how many magnificent things happened. So the lesson of my life is to think and find that something very, very troublesome and something even very dramatic happens every day. And that we just shouldn't look the other way and should we take part in it. Thank That's you very it. much. Okay. This is the Zipper family at home in Vienna. Walter, age 13, is standing, Otto, age one and a half, then Hetty, then, who is then age eight, and Herbert in the middle, age 11. The photo was taken in 1915. This is a publicity shot of Trudel, who was to be Mrs. Herbert Zipper, perched atop a telephone pole in Vienna in the year 1929. In the background, you can see the spire of St. Stephen's. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to widen out this a little bit, so make sure I get the right picture. Yeah. Okay. Can I back, back and forth? Sorry, that's really tight. And... Zoom out a little bit, maybe that's kind of better. 
This is a passport photo of Herbert Zipper taken in March 1926. This is Trudel and Herbert Zipper. Um, shortly after they were married, the picture was taken in Manila in 1940. Okay. This is uh, a picture of uh, taken on the journey to America. The captain of the Liberty ship that uh, carried the Zippers to the U.S. is holding their dachshund, Nitty. And the picture was taken by Trudel in San Francisco Harbor in 1946. Have we named everyone in the picture? Uh, no, we haven't. Let's see. We've got the captain is holding the dog, and um, Dr. Zipper is on the right, camera right. Okay. Do we remember the other two characters? No. Well, that's good. Uh, that's, that's the deal. Okay. Go ahead. This is the Zipper family in the U.S. This is the Zipper family in America. In the, la in the back row on the left is Herbert, his wife Trudel, brother Otto. And in the front row, it's Mr. and Mrs. Zipper. Uh, the picture was taken in 1946, in March of 1946, in the U.S.